Welcome to this lecture for Abnormal Psychology. Today I'll be talking about sex and gender. So what we talk about, we talk about what, uh, what constitutes normal sexuality, talk a little bit about sexual orientation, and then we'll get into DSM stuff with sexual dysfunction disorders, paraphilic disorders, and gender dysphoria. Okay, normal sexuality. What's normal? Um, well, depends to some degree, right? Um, depends on what kind of context uh, you're looking at. If you think back to at the beginning of the semester, we talked about in terms of, in general, abnormal behavior, determining what's normal and what's abnormal. We could apply some of those same thoughts to um, a sexual behavior. So sexual behavior might be abnormal if it's statistically deviant, so if it's rare, um, which is interesting because whenever there's a behavior that's statistically deviant, that's usually um, a, a time-specific phenomenon, right? Because behaviors become more and less common. So if certain sexual practices become uh, more common, then they become less statistically deviant. Uh, think about uh, um, individuals using uh, the internet as part of their uh, sexual behavioral repertoire. It's certainly something that uh, would have been, you know, zero uh, 50 years ago and very low probably even uh, 20 years ago, but certainly something that could be increasing now. And so the as technology changes, it's going to change what um, behaviors people might engage in. And so that may change what is abnormal. Well, what else can we look at? We can look at, well, does the behavior cause uh, distress? And it's something that the DSM is fairly good about is trying not to over-pathologize sexual behavior if it doesn't cause distress. So if you're happy with what you're doing uh, with your uh, sexual behavior, your orientation, your uh, sexual identity, then, hey, cool, good for you. Uh, then you don't have a disorder. But if it's causing you distress, then okay, then this might be a disorder caveat to that. The, the problem is, what if the reason you're distressed is that your immediate uh, societal environs, your, the culture that you're embedded in, isn't accepting of that behavior? They're intolerant of it. And if you were to shift to a different cultural group or, again, move forward or backward in time, if all of a sudden that would change their acceptance, if it, that would change your distress, okay, then is that behavior really indicative of a disorder? That's a, a little tricky, right? Um, one that maybe seems a little clear is if there's dysfunction present. So looking particularly at the um, sexual dysfunctions. And there are certainly um, biological processes associated with um, the act of, of sex. And there could be dysfunction uh, with some of those processes. Um, another uh, component of this is there's a general expectation that an understanding that the, the biological process of sex is associated with um, the psychological experience of pleasure. And if it's not pleasurable, then it might be dysfunctional. It's not working the way it should because it has a function. Um, and then the other thing in terms of dysfunction kind of jumps back into that same idea of distress where if your sexual behavior causes you to, to, to violate the agreements of society, kind of uh, laws, rules, moral codes, uh, then that might cause you problems, right? Might cause you uh, legal problems, might cause relationship dif difficulty. Well, then that behavior is dysfunctional. But again, there's some context there because change the context of the, the society that you're in and then it may no, no longer cause dysfunction. So again, one more reminder that when we talk about these disorders, they're not things. They're just descriptions of phenomenon existing in a period of time where people are engaging in particular behaviors that are associated with distress or dysfunction in a particular setting. Um, related to the idea of what is normal sexuality, a question people often struggle with is, well, is what's normal or even abnormal, is it the same or is it different for men and women? Okay, sexual orientation. What is it? Well, is it uh, who you have sex with? That's your sexual orientation? So not really though, I mean, that's, that's sexual behavior, right? Because there can be a variety of reasons to uh, have sex uh, with someone of um, the same 
uh, gender or sex as you or uh, the, op- uh, the other gender or sex as you um, other than that you uh, want to, right? If you were uh, assaulted, if you have uh, limited options, um, if you're in certain facilities, you can imagine, uh, where you have limited options as to uh, who your sexual partners could be, you might engage in sexual behavior that you wouldn't uh, typically otherwise. Well, then that maybe doesn't mean that's the same thing as sexual orientation. Okay, so then it's just, well, it's who you'd like to have sex with, right? No, I mean, not really that either. I mean, that's that's a little closer maybe, that, and that's sexual preference, right? And people tend to have uh, preferences, but these preferences uh, notably do seem to occur on a continuum, right? Where prefer uh, only people of the other sex than me, prefer only people of the same sex as me, but I can go either way, prefer either one. And then everywhere in between, right? So, so they're uh, like most psychological phenomena, most behaviors, most attitudes, there seems to be um, a continuum where it's not uh, it's not as categorical as we like to think of it because categories are much easier for our brains to to comprehend. Um, with again the the caveat that uh, this is kind of where those one of those sex differences, gender differences, uh, comes into play it seems to be more rigid, closer to categorical for men than for women. Right? You're going to see. Um, men that are, are, are heterosexual being further on the extreme of heterosexuality and men that are homosexual being further on the extreme of homosexuality whereas women um, that are heterosexual not being as far on the continuum typically in either direction for uh, heterosexual or homosexual because again uh, a greater sense of malleability in uh, in terms of sexual orientation sexual identity um, sexual attitudes but again so sexual orientation isn't just uh, who you have sex with who you want to have sex with what it is, it's, it's, it's more than that, right? It's part of uh, a person's identity. Not all of their identity. Um, which sometimes we get the, um, we go too far. We go, oh, you are this. Well, uh, yeah, okay. If you have some uh, ethnic identity, you know, okay. Oh, you're, um, you know, Slovenian American. Okay, that's part of who you are. It's probably not all of who you are. Same thing if you're a heterosexual, homosexual, uh, bisexual. That's one part of your identity, not all of it. But it is an important part, right? And that part of identity isn't just about sex, right? And it, you know, we all, it has sex in the title, sexual orientation. So that's kind of the part we focus on. And it's the part that some people are really uncomfortable with, so they kind of hung up on it. But it's more than that, right? It's this pattern of emotional, romantic, and or sexual attraction typically defined by biological sex of the objects of attraction. So it's who you're emotionally, romantically, and sexually drawn to. You know, who you want to be in a relationship relationship with of this special type of this kind of, um, uh, a particular type of intimacy. If you have a pattern that uh, it's always um, one group of people of a particular biological sex, okay, then that is your sexual orientation. Or if it's, you know, either biological sex that's your sexual orientation um, so what causes this? what what is the cause of a heterosexual orientation for those of you uh, out there who are heterosexual why are you that way have you ever stopped to think about that and now this question is typically presented in terms of um, what causes a uh, homosexual orientation or bisexual orientation because heterosexual is normative statistically speaking uh, and so there's this kind of um, a heteronormativity assumption of uh, which in part is uh, heterosexist where you make this assumption that everybody is this way and this is normal and anything not this is abnormal in this kind of pejorative sense right and not just the statistical statistically deviant sense but more of like a uh, morally deviant sense so I think it's important to kind of turn back the question around and say well why do some people have a heterosexual orientation? And, you know, we don't know for sure. Um, it probably has a biological component, right, in terms of uh, in utero exposure to um, levels of uh, testosterone. There's some evidence that um, as those uh, levels of testosterone uh, change for a variety of reasons, um, 
that that can influence the uh, sexual orientation of the child uh, after birth. Um, there's certainly uh, strong cultural uh, pieces regarding uh, what's, what's expected of individuals and in sexual orientation that probably shapes for a lot of people um, what they're into. Um, and again, for uh, where they have this kind of sex difference, for men, it seems to be a little more rigid and maybe a little more biologically influenced where uh, if there's a a man and he's going to have a heterosexual orientation, then you know there's not much you can do to change it. If he has a homosexual orientation, it, it's probably it's going to be that way for the rest of his life. For a woman, either way, uh, heterosexual, uh, homosexual, kind of a lesbian orientation, it might change. And for women, when they do change, typically they change to uh, expand their options, which, um, just statistically speaking, makes sense. Okay, moving on to the sexual dysfunctions. So before we talk about the sexual dysfunctions, we've got to talk about the sexual response cycle because the sexual dysfunctions typically involve where something goes wrong somewhere in the cycle. So what's the typical cycle? Typically, people experience desire, right? So they have uh, um, some level of uh, sexual fantasies, uh, a desire for sexual activity. And again, there's individual variability in this variable. Some people have stronger uh, sex drives, experience more desire than others. And this is also something that's not static. It changes over time. Um, and it's not so much that, you know, we often have this kind of a, a ageist assumption that, okay, you know, when you get older, all desire goes away. Well, no, that's not necessarily true. Um, there are many people over 65 over 75 that remain uh, sexually active uh, assuming they are uh, physically capable and have a uh, willing and physically capable partner um, so desire doesn't seem to just go away but it does uh, sometimes decline with age age uh, it can change in response to uh, illness and disease processes and then in the course of relationships it also uh, waxes and wanes it's kind of a normal thing so there's all these possible changes and there are also individual differences where some people will start higher, some people start lower uh, in their life and, and then move from there. Okay, so if you uh, have desire and you have a partner and then you go to uh, engage in sexual activity, then the, the first phase is the excitement phase, right? Where there's this physiological arousal, right? You got your um, autonomic nervous system cranking up and blood rushes to the genital organs. You have vaginal lubrication. The body is preparing itself for um, intercourse. And this is usually kind of this, uh, a fairly uh, fast portion of the, um, the cycle. So just kind of, if you're doing your Netflix and chill, you're just next Netflix and then you're chilling and then, okay, now it's excitement. Boom, here we go. And then um, as sexual activity begins, you uh, experience the plateau. So this is where arousal will continue to increase, but at a slower rate. So there's this huge uptick and then this more uh, gradual increase toward a, a pre-orgasm maximum point. So get really excited and then stay excited with slight build, slight build. And if things continue to go well, reach the orgasmic phase where there's rhythmic contraction in the sex or organs. Uh, in males, you have a, a ejaculation. Right? So it's like quick up and then plateau for different amounts of time depending on the individual and the activity. And then again, if it all goes well, continue to go to orgasm. Um, and interestingly, uh, orgasm is uh, subjectively similar in males and females, right? So there's the, the physical um, actions associated with orgasm, which are different based on anatomy, but the subjective experience in your head, how you describe the experience of an orgasm, Males and females described them pretty similarly. And they did some pretty um, creative research, I think, to, to figure out that that was true. What they did was they had a bunch of people, um, you know, describe their orgasms. Just write down, you know, give me a little paragraph. Tell me what it's like. What, what's it feel like in your head, in your mind, in your body? What's the experience for you? Right? And not, like, oh, I ejaculate. No, not that part. But everything else, what's it feel like? You know, it's uh, whatever. And then, you know, the experimenters code um, the, the biological sex of the person 
making the description, male, female. And then they give all those descriptions out to a bunch of participants. The participants then try to guess, okay, uh, was this a man describing the orgasm? Or Okay, look at a little graph here of the sexual response cycle. So uh, if we look at um, uh, line A, this is kind of where um, if things are going well, so you, you have desire and you start engaging in sexual activity, a quick upswing of excitement very quickly up to plateau, and then uh, plateau, you kind of stay feeling good to some point where you then experience this maximum level of pleasure, which triggers uh, the orgasm, those contractions of the genitals, um, where the um, excitement arousal increases to an even higher level, and then comes down, and then it may go back up again for, uh, for some people, and that can happen multiple times, um, but then at, at some point, then arousal returns to normal level, so it comes back down fairly quickly, almost mirroring that upswing of excitement, but now it's this downswing of resolution. So that's if things go well. We look at uh, line B, you have the same kind of excitement, get to plateau, but then come down a little bit, up, up, down, up, down, and it doesn't ever quite cross that line. You never cross the, the finish line uh, to orgasm, but you can't stay on plateau forever. So eventually the body says, oh, I'm tired, and you come back down to resolution with typically a slower um, downswing than if the um, orgasm had been achieved. Then we look at line C, you've got this huge upswing in excitement, um, fairly rapid, and then again rapid through plateau, and then instead of staying in plateau for any really discernible amount of time, going straight on through to orgasm, followed by rapid resolution. So we'll look in just a second about the sexual dysfunctions um, that these are associated with. But again, when things are going well, the normal sexual response cycle is A, and then you can have different types of problems where either uh, get to orgasm too quickly or never get to orgasm. Those are usually the things that people are, are, are most concerned about. Um, but as we'll see in a second, sometimes you don't even get on the chart. So the sexual dysfunction, dysfunctions in the DSM. As I said, they're typically associated with some sort of disturbance in the sexual response cycle or associated with or there's pain associated with sexual intercourse. So that's kind of where things can go wrong. Either you're not getting through that uh, kind of uh, prototypical ideal cycle the way uh, you would want, or it hurts, there's pain. And then uh, for it to be a disorder, it has to cause distress or interpersonal difficulty. An important thing here that clinical judgment always plays a role in diagnosis, right? Because in almost every diagnosis, there's some, when you talk about the, the distress or impairment in functioning, it says clinically significant. And clinically significant means a clinician makes a judgment. But in the, the sexual dysfunction disorders, it's even more explicit the role of a clinician in deciding um, whether or not something meets criteria. Um, so you look at like these arousal disorders, there's wording in there that says, um, like for um, one of the disorders for, for women, women uh, not being aroused, it, where they have low desire, it can't just be that uh, they have less desire than their partner. And so their partner's reporting, yeah, they never want to have sex. And the, and the, you know, the female is saying, yeah, I don't want to have sex as much as they do. That's not enough to meet criteria. The clinician has to come in and say, okay, well, here's this discrepancy, but how low is their desire? Is it low enough? Based on what? Well, based on the clinician's judgment. So that makes these categories a little squishy and really um, points to the need to have um, somebody who's a, a specialist in, in sexual disorders and sex therapy involved in the diagnosis of these things because um, it is a specialty area. Okay, for the sexual dysfunctions, you also will specify if it's um, lifelong or acquired. So whatever the difficulty the dysfunction is, is it something uh, that you've always had? And when we say lifelong, does it mean, oh, when you were born, you, you, were, uh, you had um, erectile disorder? Well, no, babies don't, don't have that. It's for your sexual life. So as long as you've been having sex, has this been a problem? If so, then it's lifelong. Or if it's acquired where there's some sort of um, period of normal or typical sexual functioning without this dysfunction, and then it started 
you know, now, right? Sorry, with this relationship at this time, then, then it's acquired, right? So you specify that. That may be important. Uh, and then you also specify, specify if it's generalized or situational. So generalized would be with um, across situations, across types of stimulation, so different types of sexual activities. Um, you know, no matter what you try, you have this difficulty, or I only have difficulty with you know this particular sexual act, this position, or just with this uh, uh, person. If it's limited to just a particular uh, behavior or person, it's situational. If it's across those, it's generalized, which again, uh, you, as you might expect, is important for treatment, especially if it's situational to a relationship. Well, then that's meaningful, right? Because treatment is probably going to involve something more than just working on the sexual dysfunction because it's not just about the sex. That sexual dysfunction may be a symptom of relational dysfunction. And now we'd have to work on, well, what's going on in this relationship that's leading to this uh, behavior that's causing distress. And then the severity for, for most of these is based on the amount of distress, you know, minimal, moderate to severe distress caused. Um, okay, so what are the disorders? Well, we have a couple of desire disorders. You have female sexual interest arousal disorder. So you have six months of the absence or reduction uh, in at least three of six indicators of low interest or arousal. So things like, you know, no sexual thoughts or fantasies, uh, no interest in having sex. And as I said before, it can't just be that the woman has a lower desire for sex than a partner. So these, these six indicators of low interest, and you have to have at least three of those. Male hypoactive sexual desire, which is kind of the male version of the same thing. Uh, deficient or absent sexual thoughts and desire for sex. Judgment of deficiency is made by the clinician. So this is again one of those cases where that, that clinical judgment is explicit in there. I think it's interesting to note that if you look at the kind of male version, female version of, of what is essentially the same or similar disorders, uh, the diagnostic criteria are built very differently. For f the female version, you've got these six signs of low interest, low arousal, and you have to have at least three of them. For the male disorder, you don't have that. You don't have six signs. You have, oh yeah, they don't want to have sex. Again, with, a th with some, some of this is cultural the assumption that, well, men always want to have sex, and if they don't, that's weird, and you don't, you don't, you don't need a bunch of signs of it. If there's just any indication that they don't want to have sex, then it's clearly a disorder. So there's definitely a cultural piece to that, but as we said before, some of that is also based on, on science, on the research of sexual desire and activity, where men typically, uh, on average, do show higher levels of sexual desire. So if women uh, are going to have lower levels of sexual desire, then we want to be careful not to pathologize that. If, it's, if that's just a kind of gender cultural difference, then if a woman isn't interested in, in sex as much as her male partner, we want to be very cautious not to slap a label on her saying, oh, this is a disorder, when it may just be a, a difference in a, some communication issues. Whereas for, for males, um, there's uh, less concern about overdiagnosing this. Um, but again, the assumption being that they always want to have sex and are always thinking about sex. Uh, then you also have arousal disorders, right? So think about that kind of excitement phase of the, uh, of the sexual response cycle. Uh, the one that fits in here would be erectile disorder. So difficulty obtaining uh, or maintaining an erection until completion or a decrease in erectile rigidity. Um, so again, you could have not interested in sex, male or female, or for, for males, interested in sex but then the body uh, won't perform so they they have desire but in that excitement phase when you typically have the engorgement of the genitals it's not there's not enough engorgement or it's not able to maintain so it could be excitement phase could be plateau phase but typically think about it being the excitement phase for, for this one and then you have the the orgasm disorders so if things were going well you have desire excited get up there into plateau but then either go from plateau to orgasm too quickly, so you have premature early ejaculation, uh, and this is uh, typically within within one minute of penetration and earlier than the person wanted, uh, which I guess is somewhat subjective. Uh, so either it's too early or too late. So for the too late, you have the female version, female orgasmic disorder, there's a delay or an infrequency of orgasm 
or reduced intensity of orgasmic sensations. Or in men, delayed ejaculation disorder. So marked delay or absence in ejaculation. Um, so if you're looking at kind of uh, prevalence rates, if you're going to have presenting in a clinic, sexual dysfunctions, or in, in couples therapy is where you see this sometimes, um, when people come in, uh, if they have an orgasm disorder, if it's a man, much more likely to, the, to come in with premature ejaculation than delayed ejaculation disorder. Uh, the delayed ejaculation, ejaculation disorder is fairly rare. Uh, but the, for women, female orgasmic disorder, uh, much less rare. So, again, this is one of those places where we see a, a, a sex difference, where men having orgasm too quickly and women having orgasm uh, um, not soon enough. Which you can even think about this if you have two people that have, you know, these offsetting, uh, not offsetting, but complementing disorders. Okay, where does the pathology li li lie? Is this one too soon and this one too late? Or are they just not syncing up? Which makes the treatment of sexual disorders complicated because it's not just usually individual. It al almost always there's a relational context that has to be considered. Okay. So you have the sexual dysfunctions associated with the sexual response cycle. Then there's also uh, one for, for women that involves pain, uh, genitopelvic pain penetration disorder. <clears throat> Excuse me. And this is where um, they experience uh, pain uh, upon uh, vaginal insertion or, and or fear regarding uh, insertion. And they may experience... Um, uh, the spasms of the outer third of the vagina, which is referred to as uh, vaginismus, right? So the body is, is saying, no, nope, this isn't going to happen. Uh, and if you try to force it, it's going to hurt and be uncomfortable. Uh, in terms of why these things happen, what, what people can do about it, uh, the ideologies for sexual functions are incredibly varied. Lots of different ways to get to these destinations. Um, but it can include sometimes disease processes, those uh, involving neurological disruptions, right? Because um, for the sex response cycle to work properly, you have to have proper uh, innervation, proper neurological functioning. Uh, if you don't, that can um, change things. And then vascular diseases, right? Because um, in the excitement phase, right, you see the engorgement of, um, of sexual organs. And uh, you have uh, later lubrication. And if you have vascular disease where blood isn't flowing uh, at the rate that it should through your uh, arteries or your arteries aren't um, at the appropriate pressure, that can interfere with the, the, the physical response of the sexual uh, response cycle. Medications. Often uh, a frequent side effect for some medications is sexual dysfunction, notably for um, medications used to treat psychological disorders, right? For like SSRIs, that's one of the major complaints um, for the S some of the SSRIs is that it causes um, low desire or other um, sexual dysfunctions. Uh, negative affect and negativistic thinking. So um, being depressed and, and anxious and feeling bad difficult for the sexual response cycle to um, occur normally, typically, in, in the context of lots of negative affect. And then whenever there, if there are, are difficulties with sexual functioning, often what we see happening is this pattern of negativistic thinking developing about that with negative expectations that, okay, this didn't go well last time, it's not going to go well again. And as you start thinking it's not going to go well, the mind-body connection, it influences the body for things yeah, not to go well. You have a little bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy. Uh, unfortunately, um, for some individuals, sexual dysfunction is a, a, a consequence of earlier trauma, most frequently sexual trauma, uh, abuse, sexual assault, um, which, you know, makes sense. You've got these kind of... Um, almost conditioned response where in the context of some sexual behavior you also have trauma and um, you know events that challenge your view of the world and of yourself in a really negative harmful way 
and then it can be later harder to separate the hard to separate those things when engaging in, in you know sexual behavior with a, a consensual partner to not have those those memories and those experiences still be attached and uh, reactivated which obviously will interfere with the sexual response cycle um, and then you also have uh, Gagnon's uh, script theory of, of sexual dysfunction. And this is the idea that um, social and cultural expectations inform scripts uh, or schema about sex that influence sexual behavior. They all, we develop these ideas of how things are supposed to work, what I'm supposed to do, what my role is, what their role is, uh, how good it's supposed to feel, how long it's supposed to last, what it's supposed to look like and again sometimes those scripts might not map well onto reality right um, and this is something that i think is uh, we'll see more and more research coming out uh, with the 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 prevalence the prominence of um, pornography that um, you have these unrealistic scripts being promoted in um, pornographic materials that are influencing young people's ideas of what sex is supposed to be like um, and that ultimately may lead to some uh, real challenges uh, in terms of uh, sexual behavior in healthy relationships and possible sexual dysfunctions in terms of what people can do about it in terms of treatments uh, medical treatments sometimes uh, are are helpful their medications you know for uh, erectile dysfunction, obviously uh, uh, Viagra is the, the brand name for men. Uh, they thought maybe that would be helpful for women. So far, it hasn't really played out that way. Um, and the people that uh, have other uh, sexual dysfunctions, there are all kinds of uh, implants and, and surgeries uh, that can be done. But typically, those medical treatments, those interventions that are fairly uh, invasive, are uh, last resort. And the other stuff works pretty good before you get there. The other stuff being a lot of education, like which is, is addressing those scripts, maladaptive scripts, maladaptive thoughts, assumptions people have about sex. Like, oh no, it's not supposed to be like that. Don't do that. Try this. So teaching people about the sexual response cycle, um, about the um, the interaction between two individuals during sexual activity, uh, and just giving them some some education. A lot of it just biological stuff. Um, goes a, a long way and then there's also uh, sex therapy which that is a, a subspecialty of, uh, of therapy that if anyone wants to practice they should get specialized training in and there are certain techniques that sex therapists might use like uh, sensate focus if there's a couple where they're experiencing um, uh, arousal disorders or orgasmic disorders uh, you know orgasming too quickly or not soon enough uh, sensate focus is something where you try to take the pressure off of orgasm, having it too soon, too late. And you tell couples specifically, yeah, don't, no, no genital touching. You're just going to touch in a, a, a sensual sexual way without any genital contact. And you're going to do that for a while. And then you're going to slowly build toward, you know, their preferred, uh, you know, mechanism of, of sexual activity. But you focus on the, all the other sensations of the body and take the pressure off the orgasm phase because again that seems to be what happens with some sexual dysfunctions is people put um, all their uh, all their anxieties and their fears on that one part of their sexual response cycle in the in the therapy they learn oh, there's a lot of other things that are enjoyable too don't worry about this one part or about the other parts and when you do that okay uh, other than the the sexual dysfunctions there's also paraphilias and paraphilic disorders What's a paraphilia? Kind of like it sounds. Uh, intense and persistent sexual interest other than interest in sex with a phenotypically normal, physically mature, consenting human partner. So it's uh, being interested in sex a lot other than, air quotes, normal sex, right? So if your sexual interest is in something other than just, you know, another um, consenting uh, adult, then that might be a, a paraphilia. But a paraphilia isn't a, par isn't a disorder. There's a distinction in the DSM-5 now between paraphilias and paraphilic disorders. A paraphilic disorder is a paraphilia, what we just talked about, that's currently causing distress or impairment 
or whose satisfaction entails personal harm to others. Right. So if uh, what turns you on, what you're sexually excited about is coffee tables. Every time you see a coffee table, super excited. And you can't get excited without seeing a coffee table. But uh, the people you want to have sex with are totally cool with coffee tables being in the room. Then uh, it's probably not going to cause you distress. won't cause you impairment. Not hurting anybody. So that's a paraphilia, but not a paraphilic disorder. Right? So if somebody has some, um, what well, might would typically be considered aberrant sexual interest, as long as it's not hurting anybody and not causing any distress, it's not a disorder. It's a paraphilia, because we, we like to label things and, and study them, but it's not a disorder. Keep in mind, though, for a paraphilic disorder, it's the first part is, you know, it doesn't cause you distress or impairment. So we, we say, okay, if it doesn't bother you, no big deal. But don't forget the second part or whose satisfaction entails personal harm to others. So somebody who's a pedophile, who has pedophilia, like even if it doesn't bother you that you're attracted to children, that's still a disorder because it causes harm to others. Right? If you're a, a, a sexual sadist who uh, can only get aroused um, when uh, involved with a non-consenting partner, okay, that's also a disorder. doesn't matter if it doesn't bother you. So what if you have these interests but never ever act on them? Is it a disorder? Now it gets in a gray area. Probably not. But again, as soon as there's harm, it's a disorder. So if you say, well, I never acted on it, I just looked at pictures online. Okay, if you looked at those pictures online, then you supported um, the economy involved in doing these things and thereby you caused harm, now it's a disorder. Right? So having a thought isn't a disorder, but as soon as you, it's causing harm, you have a behavior that crosses that line, the, the label applies. So what are the paraphilic disorders? Uh, we can break up into two large categories, one being anomalous activity preferences. Anomalous being the, you know, your, your $60 word for weird. Uh, so weird activity pre preferences. And then you can break these into two subcategories, one being kind of your, your courtship disorders where you have a uh, voyeuristic disorder, where you uh, achieve um, sexual gratification, excitement by watching other people, spying on other people. Um, uh, ex exhibitionist, exhibitionist, well, exhibitionistic disorder, uh, where you achieve sexual uh, arousal, gratification by exposing yourself to others, and then uh, frauderistic disorder. And this is where people, um, achieve uh, excitement, arousal, and even orgasm by rubbing up against unwilling people in crowded places, like in the, the subway, um, jostling against people. Uh, and again, so these are things where, uh, if this is what excites someone, it's a paraphilia. If it excites you and it causes you distress that it excites you, it's a disorder. Or if it excites you and you engage in it to the point that you're getting in trouble, you, you know, you're getting a, arrested for flashing, if you're an exhibitionist, uh, then it's a disorder. But if you're able to stay out of trouble and it doesn't bother you, it's just a paraphilia, it's not a disorder. Um, the uh, algo, algolagnic disorders, uh, which typically involve uh, pain, are sexual masochism disorder and sexual sadism disorder. Uh, sexual masochism, a masochist being someone that uh, enjoys being humiliated or beaten, uh, uh, embarrassed, roughed up, and that's how they get uh, sexually aroused. Uh, sexual sadism, the opposite of that, in, enjoys uh, humiliating, hurting uh, someone else. And for, again, for sexual sadists, they might have a consenting partner, right? This is where you have S and M sadomasochism, where you have a sadist and a masochist partnering together. Uh, and if they do, if they have a consenting partner, and they hurt them in a way that they like and doesn't cause permanent damage, it's not a disorder, per se. Uh, what's that? There's a interesting, disturbing movie. Uh, James Spader, Maggie Gyllenhaal, secretary, I think it is, about um, 
the relationship components of, of masochism and, and sadism. Um, it's an interesting thing. But again, the I think more concerning people are the, the sadists that like non-consenting partners. And this is where you have uh, sexual sadists who are rapists. And most rapists aren't sadists. They're just you know dirt bags who um, hurt people because they can, means of opportunity, sometimes because they're mad at somebody, um, feeling bad about themselves, and they don't come into getting excited about hurting other people. They just do it because there's an opportunity, because they can. Uh, it's in the context of some other crime. A small percentage of rapists are sadists, and th those are ones that are doing it because they enjoy hurting someone, and they can't get sexually aroused unless there's that aspect of, uh, of pain. But again, most rapists aren't sadists. Uh, but some sadists could be rapists, and those are the really dangerous ones. Okay, so you have the anomalous activity preferences. You also have anomalous target preferences. So doing weird stuff or being interested in weird stuff. Um, probably the most disturbing one for most of us would be the uh, when the target is other humans that aren't consenting. This is a pedophilic disorder. So this is attraction to uh, prepubescent children, and uh, for diagnosis, some person needs to be you know at least 16 years old and five years older than their targets. Um, and again, this is kind of like with uh, rape and sadism, uh, pedophilia and child sexual abuse, not the same thing. There's some overlap, but uh, a lot of people that engage in child sexual abuse aren't uh, pedophiles, particularly if their victims are. Um, Adolescents, post and adolescents. This is where you have, again, statistically speaking, male perpetrators, female victims, for the most part, um, where it's a, a a crime of opportunity, where there's a you know female in the home who's uh, stepchild, girlfriend's uh, child, whatever, and uh, that's how the assault takes place. But those individuals. If you you know hook them up to a plethysmograph and where you're measuring sexual arousal and showing them pictures, they don't show the pattern of arousals that that pedophiles do. They don't get more aroused by adolescents than they do by adults. They get most aroused by adults, and not aroused by kids. Where somebody with pedophilic disorder has this pattern of arousal, it's not it's not just the behavior. They are uh, their sexual arousal is off to where they get aroused by children and not uh, by adults. I mean they're. Uh, their targets are less likely to have those secondary sex characteristics. So even if, if they're, they're, they're young but they look older, then that, um, that won't be a target that they'd be interested in. Um, other anomalous target preferences would be your uh, fetishistic disorders and transvestic disorders. Uh, fetishistic disorder is whenever there's a, a non-living object or just one body part that becomes the, the, the central focus of sexual arousal uh, and excitement uh, with common ones being uh, you know shoes feet leather and it can be anything any object um, but it's it's where if it's gonna be a, a paraphilia okay well then this thing really turns you on and it's it's it turns you on more than most people for it to be a paraphilic disorder, this thing turns you on. It has to be present for you to engage in any kind of sexual activity, and it's causing you distress or causing dysfunction in your relationship because the other person doesn't always want to be wearing the big bird costume uh, during sex. Transvestic disorders, this is uh, um, cross-dressing for sexual excitement. So this is different from gender dysphoria where somebody uh, feels as, as if they are... Uh, the gender other than the one that they were um, assigned at birth. This is where, and this is men, which, back up a second, almost all of these paraphilic disorders, you know, it's like 98% men present with paraphilias. Uh, women must much less likely to present with a paraphilic disorder uh, than men. But in particular, transvestic uh, fetishism, trans transvestic disorder, uh, almost all men who get sexually aroused by wearing women's uh, clothing. And again, it doesn't usually get to the point where they think they are a woman or want to be a woman. It's just they have the sexual arousal when wearing uh, women's clothing. And sometimes 
acting as if they were uh, a woman, but mostly it's about um, those clothing objects. Um, so where do these things come from and what do you do about it? Again, etiology is incredibly varied, very mixed. Um, but almost always there's some evidence, if you go back in time and, and you know, you're doing interviews, of disorder relationships in childhood and adolescence, where in could be to the point of um, uh, abuse, assault, could just be really disruptive relationships with uh, a caregiver, but some, there's something that happened, typically, that was disruptive, that changed the path of normal development of sexual preferences. Or so the typical sexual preferences of being attracted to an adult of either the other gender or the same gender or both genders. But something happened and the focus of sexual energy and attention shifted to this other activity or this other object or to this other group of people that shouldn't shouldn't be. Um, so again, there's something with early experiences. Um, so it could be early sexual experiences uh, involving the thing that becomes part of the, 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 the fetish or the paraphilia. And then it's usually not sufficient for, okay, there's one experience and boom, there it is. What seems to be happening is the repeated experiences where, okay, so let's say there's somebody who has an early experience with um, uh, exhibitionism, and it could even be accidental, where they accidentally expose themselves uh, to others and are aroused by it. If that happens, it could be a one-time thing, oh, no big deal, but then if they later, they think about that and they uh, masturbate while thinking about that, fantasizing about that, that seems to build this uh, conditioned relationship, this learned pattern of sexual behavior over time or more and more, which again, given the discrepancy in uh, frequency of masturbation between men and women, that might be part of the reason we see much higher rates of paraphilic disorders in men than women, because they're more likely to, again, have this repeat um, training themselves to, to have this uh, different focus of sexual energy. Uh, in terms of uh, treatment, for medical treatments, there are drugs that are used for things like um, uh, sexual sadism, for uh, pedophilia, where you can reduce people's um, testosterone and desire for sex. Chemical castration is what we talk about. Um, sometimes courts order that as a condition for release. <sighs> Unfortunately, that doesn't typically really fix the problem, right? So it can, if you have a, a pedophile who's chem chemically, ca chemically castrated, they may no longer be interested in sex with these children, but they typically often still have these kind of maladaptive patterns where they still want relationships with these kids. Because for them, it, it's not just about sex. It's, yeah, that's it. Where they still may then put kids in danger and do these dangerous things. Um, and again, for long-term treatment, it's hard to uh, keep somebody on a drug that's going to uh, suppress their uh, sexual desire if they're a sadist or, or a pedophile. Unlikely to be compliant. Um, when we look at psychological treatments for, for paraphilias, uh, limited success uh, techniques you might see used um, covert sensitization where um, you're uh, imagining the uh, the thing you shouldn't be thinking about right so the, the object of the activity that's not okay and then uh, you imagine something bad happening while doing that so if you um, you have a, a voyeur. Okay, so imagine you're, you're peeping through a window and you see a person and you're getting excited and then suddenly your, uh, your husband, your wife, your boyfriend, your girlfriend walks, walks up behind you and sees you and they start yelling at you and you feel embarrassed and your mom's there and a piano falls out of the sky and crushes you. But you imagine all these bad things happening as you're imagining the thing that you like to try to break that pattern, to punish yourself, basically, to... Uh, in this kind of imaginal exposure kind of way, change the association with what something that typically led you to pleasure will now lead to negative affect. Uh, and then orgasmic reconditioning, somewhat similar, a little uh, less punitive where again, uh, people um, imagining 
the, the, the paraphilic object or activity and maybe even uh, you know, masturbating while, while doing it. And then just before they reach orgasm, okay, stop thinking about that and think about something appropriate. Think about this adult male or female um, to retrain, retrain the mind to um, associate that pleasurable sexual response with a, an appropriate target. Limited success. Okay, um, moving on to gender dysphoria. And we'll look at the diagnostic criteria in child, for children and for adolescents and adults. For children, it's incongruence between experienced gender and assigned gender with uh, six of the following indicators for at least six months. So a desire to be or insistence that one is the other gender, a strong preference for wearing clothes typical of the other gender, a strong preference for cross-gender roles in play, Strong preference for toys or activities stereotypically associated with the other gender. Strong preference for playmates of the other gender. Uh, strong rejection of toys or activities stereotypically associated with the natal gender. Uh, strong dislike of one's sexual anatomy. And strong desire for sex characteristics that match one's expected gender. Okay. So if we're talking about somebody that's uh, uh, natal male that's born a male this would be uh, that they want to be uh, a girl this is uh, you know think about uh, biologically a boy uh, they want to be a girl or insist they are a girl um, they want to wear dresses and skirts um, whenever they play they want to play the mom or if there's some sort of stereotypically feminine role of uh, you know nurse or teacher they always want to play that but emphasizing the, the femininity of the role uh, preference for activities there, typically the other gender. So not uh, not wanting to engage in rough and tumble play, wanting to you know feed a baby, uh, those types of things. Um, wanting to hang out with girls and not with other boys, and then a rejection of uh, you know trucks and guns and again rough and tumble play type stuff. Uh, dislike of their own anatomy. You know why do I have this uh, this penis? It's gross. I I want it off. <clears throat> And then a strong desire to, um, you know, to look like a girl. Uh, you know, I want, uh, I want breasts like mommy. I want to look like that. That's who I am. Um, so for kids, it has to be at least six months with at least six of these things uh, for diagnosis. And it also has to cause um, distress or impairment. Um, which... Atypical um, or non gender non conforming behavior in kids is not uncommon, right? So, for uh, a little boy to say, I'm, I'm going to be a mommy when I grow up, a little girl to say, I'm going to be a daddy when I grow up, not atypical. And for some periods of time, uh, kids may exhibit all these, these uh, indicators wanting to be a girl if they're born a boy, wanting to be a boy if they're born a girl. And then it um, it goes away, it changes. And when it, it changes, most often we see for, for boys is, uh, okay, if a, a boy is exhibiting a lot of um, non-conforming uh, gender behaviors, uh, okay, well then he's more likely than a boy who didn't do that to later um, adopt a homosexual orientation when he begins to have a sexual orientation, right? Kids don't really have one. They're not interested in sex. Um, but they, they don't typically go on to exhibit this dysphoria. But if you're looking at six months, okay, now this may be something that, that's more stable. Maybe. And again, something that's pretty rare for it to happen that long and so there's not a lot of good data still on the stability uh, of gender dysphoria from childhood into adolescence. We're talking about small numbers of, uh, of cases uh, that we're studying so still learning about it. For adolescents and adults you have less stringent criteria. Right? For, for kids you had to have six, of it, six indicators because again you've got this, these things, this happens and it fades so we don't want to really call it a disorder unless there's lots of indicators not just one or two things happening 
So again, you have the same type of thing where you have incongruence between experienced gender and assigned gender, but now instead of six things, just two of the following uh, for six months. Uh, an incongruence between experienced gender and sex characteristics. So um, if your uh, your sex characteristics show tell you the outer world that you're a woman, but you experience yourself as a man. Uh, a desire to be rid of those sex character characteristics uh, because of incongruence. So if, uh, a woman desire to get rid of your, your breasts. If natally a man, desire to get rid of the penis. And sometimes you have, see people um, in the past, uh, society has certainly changed a lot recently, in the past whenever there was really much lower levels of acceptance for uh, this type of thing, people taking really drastic steps um, to get rid of their sex characteristics, um, kind of self-surgery type stuff. Um, a strong desire for the sex characteristics of the other gender. So, uh, natally a man wanting breasts, natally a woman wanting uh, to have a penis. Uh, strong desire to be of the other gender, uh, to be treated as the other gender, and conviction that one has the typical feelings of the other gender. Right. So, uh, not just it's not just about the body. It's about no my mind. So, uh, born natally a woman, but but I'm a man. I'm, I, I think like a man. I feel like a man. Um, I'm just I'm in the wrong body. Same thing for for people folks that were born natally uh, male. No, I'm I'm a woman. I have the same type of uh, empathic responses that most women do. I think and feel like a woman. I am a woman. Somebody just messed up and put me in the wrong body. Right? And when we say put me in the wrong body, it's not um, this kind of delusional thinking like you might see with psychosis, where they think literally someone, you know. Uh, downloaded a, their, their program from the matrix and into the wrong uh, being or pluck their soul out and cast a spell and put them in the wrong body. That would be psychotic thinking. This is just this feeling that it's not right. right? It's not a delusional belief that somebody did something to you to, to make this happen. And again, to be diagnosed with a disorder needs to cause uh, distress or impairment. Okay, so looking at gender dysphoria um, a little more broadly. It's not a disorder unless it causes distress or impairment. Right? So whether or not it's going to cause impairment uh, and even distress to, to some degree is largely dependent upon context. Right? If you have, uh, if your gender identity is incongruent with your biological sex, and you live in Texas, you are going to experience more distress and more impairment than if you live in Southern California. Right? There's no question about it. Right? We've got uh, people looking at passing uh, legislation targeted particularly at people like you out of fear that you are some threat or danger. That's going to cause distress. That's going to cause uh, an impairment because you're going to be faced with um, greater stigma. And um, unfortunately, individuals that, have, um, that are transgender are at much greater risk for being victims of violence than people who aren't transgender. Um, so there's some distress impairment that's going to be there if you're transgender. So no, maybe it wouldn't normally bother you. No, this is how I am, and I, I get it. Yeah, I'm, I'm in the wrong body, but I'm, I'm working on it, figuring it out. Well, it's still going to cause you distress and impairment as long as society is the, the, the way it is. Um, Assigning the label and saying someone meets criteria for the disorder, keep in mind that what disorders mean. If you meet criteria for the disorder, it means that, okay, yeah, you feel this way, it's causing trust impairment, we should do something about it. To do something about it isn't necessarily, well, then you should stop feeling that way. It might be, okay, um, and we'll get down to this in a minute, sexual reassignment surgery might be the answer. So it's not that, uh, it's not that you're crazy for feeling like this, it's that you're feeling like this and it's causing you problems. So it's a, it's a um, something that deserves clinical uh, focus and attention to help you feel better. And how to feel better? There's a variety of paths to that. Okay. Before we get to to, to that, um, as I said already, gender non nonconformity in childhood does not always equate with gender dysphoria uh, later. For for some kids, it's a phase. Some of those. Um, will go on to have gender dysphoria as adults. Some will go on to have a, uh, a homosexual or lesbian sexual orientation. Some of those are going to have a heterosexual orientation. Some of those are going to have a bisexual orientation. So it, it happens. And 
this I think something that um, is confusing and concerning to some people is when we have gender nonconformity in childhood what do you do do you push back against it do you support it in either way what's going to happen and ultimately gender identity um, seems to have a really strong biological component and so you're probably not gonna force the issue right and if you do try to force it one way or the other their body their brain is going to push back and that's the tricky part is the pushback might be painful right if you try to make somebody something they're not that's probably gonna lead to some depression increase the risk of suicide and self-harm um, so it's a tricky situation either way important to keep in mind that gender identity is not the same thing as sexual orientation right so if you have a, a, a trans man someone who is uh, natally uh, a woman but their gender identity is that of uh, a man regardless of if they've uh, transitioned or not with surgery and uh, medication or not if that uh, trans man is uh, you don't know if they're attracted to men or women or both right all you know is their gender identity you don't know their sexual orientation and trans men trans women show all the different sexual orientations that non-trans individuals show so not the same thing they are independent as i already said there's a really strong biological component to gender identity and um hopefully you read uh, in your book there's some really tragic cases of if you try to force people into a gender identity, gender identity that isn't true for them, it it causes problems, significant problems. So for for some people, the the answer, the solution is sexual reassignment surgery, and for in most places where this is an option, um, there's a process to go through where you have to go through um, uh, counseling. And you talk about what it's going to be like and this isn't some people think oh well you have to go through counseling because you may not really want it and you're probably going to regret it it's pretty rare for people to regret it um and the counseling isn't like the screener to say well we want to make sure you're not uh crazy and that you really want to do this drastic thing to your body it's not about that it's about this is a significant medical procedure that's going to lead to a change in how you experience the world and the world experiences you let's talk about what it's going to be like and help you prepare for that transition most successfully right. and as you're doing that some people may uh, decide oh you know what I'm not ready right now or maybe I'll never be ready and that's something that they can discover and talk through um, in in therapy before having the, the, the surgery okay take home uh, sexual orientation uh, it's part of your identity it's not all your identity regardless of what your orientation is it's just one thing about you um, gender also part of your identity it's not everything about you it's an important piece no doubt it's just one piece uh, sexual dysfunction it's typically associated with either uh, impairment in the sexual response cycle at some stage or pain but most of them are about the, the response cycle A variety of reasons why they can happen uh, but again with intervention pretty successful getting people um, to achieve normal cycles uh, paraphilias their disorders if they cause distress or if you're hurting somebody if you're not then hey you do you related when it comes to sexual behavior varies significantly across cultures and changes across time right you can read about uh, cultures that are very different than ours and you read about their sexual practices you may be like you may be uh, disgusted you may be envious but you'll no doubt notice that wow that is very different than what I think is normal and that should point out that if you can kind of shift your perspective for a minute imagine you're them looking at you and them going oh my gosh I'm disgusted I'm, env I'm envious that's definitely not normal to some degree normal is subjective and that seems to be um, particularly true for sexual behaviors even beyond the other th behaviors uh, thoughts and feelings we talked about in this class uh, and again the what's normal will change across time as there are shifts in cultural shifts and societal shifts
Okay. That's all for now. Take care.